Welcome to the Tax Talk Podcast and a special episode with Melanie Mitchell Epp. Melanie is a CPA, CGA, a gifted communicator, an inspirational teacher, and a compelling mentor and coach. She works alongside of her husband, Garth, at Your Limits Lifted. Together, they have been providing coaching, mentoring, speaking, and training services and have recently launched a suite of technology tools to help with small business owners. I personally had the privilege of working with Garth via their coaching program, as well as Melanie and Garth recently in setting up a landing page, estateplanalberta.ca, for an upcoming estate planning seminar that I'm co-hosting on October 18th at the Innisfail Golf and Country Club. So Melanie has asked to join the podcast today to uh, do a little bit of promotion. She has felt that it was important to kind of come on today, share some experience that she has had recently with some uh, estates that she has taken some ownership of, a little bit of interaction on the power of attorney side, and just provide a little bit of personal background as far as her experience and maybe give a little bit of that personal touch to people as opposed to maybe some of the technical lingo that comes out of myself, the lawyers, the investment brokers, things of that nature. So, Melody, I just want to say thank you for taking some time to hop on the podcast with me. Glad to be here today, Jared. Perfect. So, like I mentioned, we are hosting an estate planning seminar on October 18th. That is at the Innisfil Golf Club. What we're kind of looking to do is hit on the six pitfalls that we are kind of finding as accountants, lawyers, and investment brokers that people are finding when they are dealing with estates. So the first one being, you know, the issues of seeing broken relationships, you know, family breakdowns, people fighting over the estate, the, you know, the leftover assets, those things. Number two, you know, even before the estate uh, kind of gets settled is the big issue of not having a will or not having one properly crafted. Number three, looking into the very important topic of having that right personal representative. When you pass away, you want to make sure that the proper person is in place to be able to take care of your affairs after you've, uh, you've passed on. Number four is just looking at some potential missed opportunities as far as investments go. This can be due to timing, again, not having that proper will in place. And then number five and six kind of delve into the tax side of things. So a lot of people, you know, understand that they have to pay tax upon passing, but a lot of people don't understand some of the sources in which that tax can arise. And then lastly, just missing some tax planning opportunities and having to pay an exorbitant amount of tax when it may not be required. So, without further ado, we will kind of get into this. So first off, Melly, I just wanted to maybe get you to provide a bit of background. I know that you've dealt with two estates within the last couple of years. Without, you know, kind of divulging any personal details or anything like that, would you be able to going to provide the listeners with a bit of background as to, you know, those situations, your experience, that type of thing. Sure. Perfect. So, like Jared said, I'm a CPA, CGA. I have five years of public practice experience, over 25 years of nonprofit experience. But coming into a season where in a couple of years I went through the passing of my grandma and my dad, I found out that all my experience and my training hadn't equipped me to navigate some of the complexities that come along with the final season of life and and going into dealing with an estate. And so when when I found out that that Jared and the the co-presenters were doing this complimentary presentation, my heart was just excited because we don't know what we don't know and that was my conclusion coming through this season was there's a few things where i thought if only i had known and i'm a teacher at heart and so i always think if i can help somebody navigate something rather than help them clean it up afterward that's what i'd like to do and 
So I, I think probably I could say that that you as an accountant or Caleb as a lawyer mm -hmm. or uh, Stefan as an advisor would rather help people on the navigation side than the cleanup side, even though the cleanup side would probably generate more business. 100%. Is that right? 100%. 100%. <laughs> it's just more fulfilling to help people yeah. and, and make the best out of a situation. And I went into handling my grandma's affairs not with an with an ask or an understanding of responsibility it simply started with realizing that grandma wasn't able to keep her bills paid she, i would go to see her and they they would just be sitting on the table and and just out of honor and love i started meeting those practical needs and of course it didn't get better her ability to manage and so it became me becoming a joint uh, signer on her bank account just to take that burden off of her and then eventually it became power of attorney because it it just was so taxing on her to navigate her her decisions I could still explain them to her but ultimately I was handing handling the paperwork and the conversations and I just it, it became something I never anticipated doing making financial decisions on her behalf navigating things tax planning and i was it was an honor to do it for her and yet it was really complex for sure yeah it is definitely perfect so yeah i think that gives us kind of a good idea as to where we're kind of approaching this mm -hmm. and kind of hitting this from a personal side and you know there is a lot of responsibility that goes into these roles and i think a lot of times people will you know They'll nominate you as a, a representative or power of yeah. attorney. You take that on, like you said, out of honor. And you know, if you're not properly prepared for that, mm -hmm. you're probably in for a fairly big surprise as to you know the type of work that's involved, the time periods that are involved, and uh, it always is beneficial to be prepared ahead of time. Yeah. So, yeah. perfect. So the first kind of pitfall that we wanted to touch on was family relationships. So I know a lot of times when clients come into the office here, probably the biggest thing that I see on the estate side is either the family gets along really well, mm -hmm. things go very smoothly, or the polar opposite is there, people are fighting, the lawyers are involved, and it's a complete mess. And for me, it's difficult to kind of see that mess, to see the hurt on people's, you know, just on their face, you could see it in their heart. Yeah. You know, sometimes people will come in here and they will they will cry for yeah. a significant period of time because, you know, they don't want that to be the legacy of their parents that the kids are fighting over the assets and things of this nature. So I, I like to, you know, always advise my clients that the most important part of estate planning is not necessarily minimizing tax or seeing that the assets get you know, pushed around to the right beneficiaries, but it's protecting that legacy and having that family move on. So as, you know, a power of attorney or dealing in the estates that you did, did you kind of have any of these issues crop up at all for yourself? Well, the, dealing with my grandma and, and, my, and my dad's passing were two really different experiences. And my my grandparents uh, worked hard, planned well. They had they had a will. They had investments. They had life insurance. They had funeral insurance. Mm -hmm. My grandma even had a book that the funeral had, funeral home had given her when my grandpa passed away, where she had written out her wishes. And when we were planning her funeral, it felt like she had given us the plan already. Like the the things that they had in place to to mitigate end of life was was really well well done and I was thankful for that and there was a high degree of trust among family members and so even being power of attorney or or helping pass pass over the responsibility when she died because one of the surprises to me was that power of attorney ends upon death like one day I'm I'm everything and the next day I'm nothing yeah. and it was like oh I, I, nobody told me that and um, so it so that that situation was really clean 
um, and my grandma was 96 when she died. And so it, there was incredible grief because my grandma was one of the closest people in my life, sure. but yet it was clean. On the other hand, with my dad, uh, my dad had another family. Um, there, his health declined really rapidly. Uh, having to be at the hospital with him and make the decision to remove life support, support was one of the hardest days of my life. And so bring some of those dynamics into dealing with, with estates and, and messiness. And I, I didn't know any of my dad's end of life wishes, uh, what he wanted and everything I found out was a surprise. Um, I didn't, I had never met his executor before. I didn't know what was in the will. I actually had to ask am I a named beneficiary in the will? And that was like several months after my dad died. And it, it, that was a humiliating thing. Like it was like, and yet I had heard conversations from prior to that that indicated sort of what my dad's wishes were that were contrary. And so, so much emotion yeah. in, in the midst of just thinking about having to do legal things, tax, tax things and and I've also um, helped other families with situations that have been terribly messy suicides uh, uh, drug overdoses and having you know been with families as they, as they took their their child off life support or like so mine have been relatively minimal and yet I know that's not the norm and so I think the will and the estate can just almost become the outlet for family dynamics that already exist, that have never been properly dealt with, and it can just be explosive. And so what, what a burden to put onto your family to not have an estate plan, to not have things, your wishes made clear. It's, it's a big deal and it doesn't need to be that way. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, when you are in that vulnerable time and you want to be able to grieve and, and process things, you don't want to be trying to find the lawyer at the last minute to get a will drafted up on someone's deathbed. You just want to have these things in place so your family knows what it is that you want and then they can process you know, properly process everything and just kind of leave some of this technical stuff behind because at the end of the day, you know, that stuff's going to get handled, but uh, you know, being able to grieve in the process that works best for your family, I think, yeah. is, is an important thing. Yeah. Perfect. So on to number two is that importance of having the will. So I know, again, clients come in here, a lot of times they will have a will in place and these things, things go quite smoothly. This is what happens. These are the you know personal representatives. You know, if the lawyer needs to be involved, we have an easy way to you know move the documents there. We can go through probate, take care of all the necessary steps that way. I've seen it on the flip side when people die without a will, mm -hmm. and then we have to go through the process of applying to courts to you know become a guardian of the assets. And mm -hmm. again, it's it's this whole thing of. You know, losing time that you could be spent grieving on taking care of you know court ordered documents and yeah. things of this nature so I know you kind of briefly touched in it in that last one but is there anything else that you can kind of elaborate you know maybe specifically on the side of your dad's kind of going through that process maybe not knowing what was in the will and kind of having to play that out for a few months there mm -hmm. yeah so having to um, just because I hadn't informed myself, it hadn't occurred to me to inform myself about some of these things. And so, so you're offering people, you know, I don't know how long it is, an hour and a half maybe to come and inform themselves right. and be aware so that as things are happening and they're making decisions, they're like, oh yeah, they said, they said this. Instead, I'm, I'm talking to a lawyer and going, you know what about this or even some of the questions that came up I thought for about 10 days that my grandma's will wasn't legal and and I was horrified I'm like what like I've made this kind of a mistake and and again it was just a just a lack of knowing and it, it turned out okay 
But um, there's things along with the will. Typically, if you go to get a will made up, there's personal directive, and and it's it's not just the will itself. Even though my grandma's things were really well planned, her her executors and her personal representatives were five and nine hours away. My sister and I were 10 minutes away. So we're the ones in the last season of her life that are on the ground, seeing how she is, being given the choices, drug choices, financial choices, all the choices, but we're having to relay them to people that are at a distance and and hey, can I send you this fax and, and I have to fax the other person. Like so complex, sure. things that could be uh, considered when you're actually writing the will, like yes, this is a logical person, but they actually aren't near you. So does that, is proximity even considered? Because often the lawyer is just capturing your wishes, mm -hmm. right? They're, and that was her wishes but it didn't make sense right. at, in, in that end time. And um, I just think it's, it's important that, that we take the time to think things through. Um, just saying if there was anything else that I had thought about. I have another, I have another family member right now that's navigating. Uh, they had a family member pass five years ago without a will. And it now the ramifications of that are just surfacing now. And again, it means a legal bill. It means time. It means for all of the family members coming together again, navigating everybody's emotions. And if there's any, if there's any ripples, they're going to come up with with that. And it was totally unnecessary. You know, probably for it would have been a really basic will. It would have been a few hundred dollars. And it just created a problem that got paid forward when, and I just think, let's not do that to, what kind of legacy is that? Exactly. Let's, let's get it right. Exactly. And I, I think that's probably a common misconception too. You know, I think a lot of people presume, well, I'm getting maybe up in years, maybe I need my will at that point in time. But I think a lot of younger clients have come in here and they've, just started a family, maybe they have a small business, and I don't think they're aware of the fact that, you know, if something were to happen to mm -hmm. both of them, that child is going to be, you know, the responsibility of mm -hmm. the province then. And I don't think I've met any parents in my entire life that are going to be wanting to see that situation occur. And like you say, a little bit of planning, maybe a few hundred dollars, mm -hmm. whatever the cost is, to get your wishes in, in regards to what happens to your son or daughter, is going to be invaluable because, you know, either they're set up with a, you know, family that they can go live with for, you know, a number of years, yeah. or they might be flip flopping through the court system and, and dealing with things that could, you know, dramatically impact them for the rest of their lives. So, I know no one likes to talk about, you know, drafting that will, but it's an important step that people need to take and, and everybody should have that, that tool. And sometimes because. I think we don't talk about it because we haven't talked about it. And the first couple or three times we talk about it, it feels really ugh. Yep. But the more that, um, the more that my husband and I have talked about it, the, the more natural it's become. And then particularly just going through these, the loss of my, my dad and my, my grandma, sure. it's just like, no, this actually needs to be talked about just as a normal part of life. And, and there's even simple things um, that we don't think about. Like, I've made sure both our names are on our vehicle registration because, because I went through a, a divorce where there was one, one name on the registration and in the midst of actually navigating a separation I can't renew the registration on my vehicle because my ex won't sign off on it. So now I'm not only going through everything being upside down in my life, I can't drive. And <laughs> and so I don't want, you know, my spouse passing away now and me not being able to drive because we didn't put both our names on 
on the registration. Now, is it a forever problem? It's not, but it sure is just a silly inconvenience that it, it, it's like our, who's, whose names are on the bank accounts? It Just thinking through some of those things, where are the papers, whose name are they in? I spent lots of time trying to track down a life insurance policy that my dad had and and that the name that was in it was like, no, we have no record of that. We knew it existed, but right. not finding it. So we can do so much to just put things in order. 100%. So we've kind of touched on this one a bit, the personal representative, the power of attorney. I know this is a, a very important piece because you know, you're taking care of, of someone over, it could be a very significant mm -hmm. amount of time. Um, you're basically acting as an agent on their behalf, making all sorts of very important decisions regarding, you know, their finances, their well-being, um, those types of things. So, like you mentioned before, I think a lot of times people will just nominate someone that maybe they, they have a good relationship with or, you know, they're older, so I have some respect for them, let's nominate yeah. them. But I think at the end of the day, it's important to find that person that is going to be local, they're available, they have maybe some sort of financial background like yourself so they can navigate some of these issues. So kind of in conjunction and in, in addition to you know, dealing with the bank accounts, what else did you kind of have to handle as far as that power of attorney? And how many years did that kind of take place? Uh, that was that was over a period of about ten years, like starting at a really minimal level, and then and then just just growing yeah. because my grandma kept kept aging. So making medication decisions was was a big responsibility, and so then it caused me to go um, in choosing a personal representative myself. I need somebody that understands my values, like right. like some people want all the drugs, some people want none of the drugs you want to pick somebody that's going to choose a quality of life for you that that represents actually what what you want like sure. think about that and then another thing is thinking about who you're choosing for an executor and how old they are because when you write your will maybe they're the same age as you and maybe you're 40 right but then if you're 80 they're 80 or you know, um, my grandma was 96, so her kids are in their 70s. Right. So there, it, I think it's good to reevaluate every five years, maybe. And uh, Garth and I are a second marriage. We both have kids from our first marriages. So there's a whole set of complexities there that relationships are even more um, tenuous because a blended family is kind of like oil and water not like a smoothie <laughs> and so we've done our best to to put not not put any additional burden on our kids should something happen to one of us that that they would all feel cared for and loved and provided for and yeah it's a big deal it is, it is for sure <laughs> And I think that's a really good point when you're nominating someone for these positions that you find someone that isn't the same age. And if you have to maybe go down that road, maybe name an alternate to that person. That way, if you, know, you do happen to need these services when you are in your mid-80s, that there is a fallback option that you are not relying on someone else that is also in the home with you to <laughs> go and write your checks and take you to medical appointments because it's probably not going to work out so well. Yeah. So yeah, like you said, probably every five years or any mm -hmm. major changes in life, you know, marriages, divorces, mm -hmm. births of children, all health, these things. Health yeah, changes. Exactly. Yeah. All these major things, this is probably where you should sit down and say, mm -hmm. I need to review my plan. A plan isn't something that you're going to come out to October 18th listen for an hour and a half and say, I've got my plan, I'm good to go. Yeah. Your plan is, I do a bit of work now, mm -hmm. it works for me right now, as my family progresses, then we review yeah. it and we make a bit of changes as it goes along. That way, yeah. when you eventually need it, 
it is going to be fine-tuned to what it is that you need at that juncture in life, not what you needed 30 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah. perfect. Up next is investment opportunities. So we kind of touched on, you know, some of the downfalls of not having a will. Some of the estate assets are going to get basically trapped in limbo while you get a court approvals and things of these nature. Sometimes when that happens, you can miss out on some planning opportunities as far as investments go. You're maybe not capturing some interest income. Maybe your small business gets caught in limbo and no one's able to run it correctly because you don't have the proper you know, documents in place. So did you kind of run into any scenarios with that as far as kind of the timing of maybe the disbursement of assets or anything like that within these two estate cases? Actually, with my grandma, uh, because because she moved here and was, was closed, and as I began helping her, then um, began looking at her investments and, and what she had, and because I'm a CPA, CGA, I, I had the opportunity to start thinking, if, if all of this is just left until her death, there's actually going to be a big tax bill, but we could, we could make some, we could make some dispositions, we could do some different things that, that really she ended up paying almost zero tax in those last five years of her life and right. And, and it, it came only because I was aware if she hadn't lived here, um, you know what, that probably wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. And there would have been a lot of money that went to taxes instead of going to the beneficiaries just because there wasn't the opportunity for somebody to even be thinking that way. And sometimes we have like investment advisors and we have people that are each playing their role, but often what they're doing is playing defensive, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. mitigating risk sure. rather than then planning and going, how could we best do this? Unless you're being really intentional asking those questions. And so I feel like I had the opportunity to actually handle my grandma's um, assets really well that she did leave something generous to her to her beneficiaries. And, and I, I, uh, it was a privilege to be able to do that. But if you don't know then this, this seminar is just an opportunity to go, oh, there's questions that I could ask. I could ask the accountant, like, like what do you see for tax planning? Is there a way to deal with this? We're, we're not at end of life. We're not six months away. We're not, maybe we're 10 years away, but how, how could we use this season to be progressive with investing as well? So, um, and then in even it it worked in a way that I was able to actually transfer a bulk of cash to her beneficiaries almost immediately after mm -hmm. death like when it wasn't all wasn't all tied up in the estates so, perfect yeah yeah, yeah and that kind of reminds me of a client that came in this past tax season an elder elderly gentleman and you know he had some investments that were in non-registered accounts mm -hmm. And just looking at the tax return, getting it prepared, looking at kind of what he had his money invested in, you know, not necessarily my specialty, but kind of having a bit of background and saying, you know, you've got a significant amount of dollars tied up in some somewhat volatile oil field stocks. So in your mid 80s, does it make sense to have all these dollars invested in here or should you know, you maybe have a conversation to say, maybe I should diversify a bit of this and make sure that yeah. I'm not going to be missing out on, you know, retirement home payments because yeah. my oil field stocks crash. So I think that's a good point. Mm -hmm. If people are kind of aware of, of what is going on mm -hmm. and they can kind of make some decisions ahead of time, you yeah. can plan for the tax. Yeah. Plus you can always, you know, take steps to protect yourself as far mm -hmm. as possible liquidation issues too. So... Very good. Next one is looking at kind of the tax liability side a bit more. I think a lot of Canadians, like I mentioned at the onset, have a good understanding that when they pass, you know, their assets need to be recognized at fair market value. Depending on the circumstances, you might be paying 
a significant amount of tax on some of these items. You know, if you've got a family cottage or something that's been mm -hmm. sitting in the, the family for a couple of decades, it's accrued in value. There could be a fairly big tax bill with that. But I think there are a number of things that clients just don't fully understand as far as different income sources that come in that can attract tax. So with your background, obviously you had some you know, knowledge of the Tax Act and, and how mm -hmm. things process, but were you kind of surprised with you know, how things needed to come together, the time periods to do some of these final tax returns and everything that kind of went into to kind of getting that process completed? Yeah, it, it was a lot of work. Right. Even though it, hers was in, in actually right. good order, it was still a lot of work and it was like uh, date of death. <laughs> Seldom lines up with the calendar right. year end. Yep. <laughs> and so you're you're waiting for slips from a from a calendar year system to to deal with in a in a death year system. And of course some of the slips then are automatically going to the executors now because because of the change. And so you're I was getting slips from 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 both executors depending what they had done right. and what I still had access to and actually my grandma got a couple of medical expense audits Fun. and so that was messy mm -hmm. because because uh, power of attorney had ended <laughs> right <laughs> yeah <laughs> but I'm the one with the knowledge right. to to actually best navigate it and um, so it was really time-consuming it that's all I can say it was, it was really time consuming, even though I was well equipped. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I would agree. I mean, even clients that come in here with very simple estates that have you know, all their affairs in order, it is a time consuming process. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want us to kind of act on your behalf, we need to get copies of certain documents. Yeah. We have to send them into CRA. That takes a while for them to process. And we've got to send in our authorization form. That takes some more time to process. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that in 2023, a lot of these slips are not coming out for clients right away. So mm -hmm. typically you might be able to put together a final return in 23 and, and just kind of get everything wrapped up and moved mm -hmm. on. But I'm finding that, you know, without some of this information, we're going to have to drag these things into 24. So by the time you get the tax return prepared next spring, you wait to get that assessed, you get a clearance certificate back, you very well could be looking at, you know, a year and a half or yeah. more, just for a very simple, straightforward estate. And, yeah. and I think it's important for everyone to kind of understand that, because I, I know everybody that comes in here just, you know, they want to get everything filed, they want to get it done, they want to move on, and I completely understand that, but there is a process, and unfortunately, yeah. when you and deal with the government, things take time, and you mm -hmm. just have to be aware of that as you proceed with the process, so. Yeah. And it, so how could somebody best bring their records into you? Like, my, my time was just being given. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> it, that, that, that's how it was, but, but when someone's paying you, right. um, and they're dealing with that time, how could they best, how could they make the best use of your time right. so that they're paying as little as is necessary to get the job done, but recognizing this isn't a one appointment process. Right. So yeah, I think on that first meeting, if we get the certificate of death, we get that copy of the last will, that gives me a good start to move the process ahead with CRA, depending on whether you've had to go through probate or not. If you've got a listing of assets and liabilities, then that gives me a good working place to say, well, we're going to have some income coming from these assets. These are the slips that we're going to need, or we're going to need values on the cottage, or we're going to need something for the business. Mm -hmm. And then that helps me direct the questions to specifically what I need. We can kind of avoid going off into little rabbit holes of yeah. things that probably aren't going to impact you. And then that way we can kind of maximize my time, lower the bills on, on the clients. Yeah. So. Uh, one of the, this isn't in any of your questions, but one of the challenges that happened with my grandma's estate was my, one of, one of the executors opened the estate account at a certain bank and there was no issue opening the account. And this is going to sound unbelievable, 
but when everything was done and it was time to liquidate the account, they, the bank did not know what to do. The staff in the bank did not know what to do and he Great. spent hours and multiple appointments and he's going, you had no problem taking the yeah. money and now you don't know how to give me the money. And, and so even keeping things in line with what the deceased person has already got established would be a, a thing that wouldn't have occurred to me before this experience. But um, it, if you can, if you can, if the invest, if they have investments, and the investment place is applying for a waiver of probate, and you can have their banking coincide with that. Best thing to do: don't go to a separate <laughs> space and right. and open another account. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think keeping things simple is probably your best route, mm -hmm. for sure. So lastly, regarding tax planning. So we kind of delved into this with your grandma. Mm -hmm. We were able to do a bit of pre-planning, and I think that's a very important kind of point to note is the planning has to be done in advance. Mm -hmm. If we are getting to end of life and we are trying to implement these things days before someone passes, yeah. There's just no opportunity for things to get accomplished. Yeah. So if you can take the steps to put a plan in place, have a proper power of attorney, etc., working on your behalf, you're probably more apt to be able to take advantage of some of these yeah. opportunities. Yeah. So with the side of your grandma obviously going fairly well, were there some you know instances on your dad's side where mm -hmm things maybe fell through the cracks and mm -hmm. you could have seen some better planning opportunities if, if things were done a little bit differently? Yeah. Yeah, um, like not everybody's open to input. Right. Right? 100%. <laughs> so you can only do what you can do. I think the sure. one thing with my grandma, there was one, there was one decision that if I could uh, redo it, I would. And the, her investment advisor, I asked a question about one of the investments and and the investment advisor's response didn't really sit well with me, but it, you know, it's a trusted person sure. that she's sure. chosen. And so, and so I, I accepted it, but if I could go back and do it, I would ask some scenario questions. Sure. So, okay, you've said this, but if this, what will happen? And if this, what will happen? And when you actually follow it down the road a little bit, I think I would have come to a different mm -hmm. conclusion that after the fact wasn't able to wasn't able to um, take back and, and one of those was like you mentioned with your client with the investments in the volatile markets right. and so it there was an investment in the market that mm -hmm. that we should have just mitigated the risk right right, right then and and change the investment right. and but everything was fine and so <laughs> We left it that way, but sure. ask what if questions. I one of my my favorite questions with professionals, because because they're trained to answer your question. But one of my favorite questions, whether it's a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant, is if you were in this position, what would you do? They won't always ask answer that, but if this if you were in this position what would you be asking or what would you be thinking about and often it'll actually glean more valuable information than them just straight answering your question because sometimes your questions aren't very good you're just asking the best question you know right. how you sure. don't know what else sure. to ask right. so that's a good point in the fact i think two things like you said, you can only ask the questions that you know. Mm -hmm. So if you're not able to lead the discussion where you might think it needs to go mm -hmm. because you have no idea where it needs to go, you might be missing out on yeah. some of that information. Mm -hmm. And then I guess number two, I'm going to take a fairly safe guess and say you knew your grandma's affairs more than any other accountant or lawyer or anyone mm -hmm. else that could have possibly popped into that situation would ever know. Yeah. So you know, probably trusting your gut on some of these things when you're yeah. going into these meetings and, you know, if something comes up that maybe you 
feel a little bit off on, you know, you just delve into that a bit yeah. more and say, you know, based on what you said, maybe grandma would have wanted this or grandma, you know, whatever the case might be. Yeah. And I think that would be a good way to kind of ensure that all that information is communicated. Because, you know, as an accountant, I can ask as many questions mm -hmm. as I know. And it, it's mm -hmm. probably just to kind of, you know, let's get through the door with CRA. Let's get yeah. through the door with yeah. getting all these things that we need to prepare the return. But I don't have a lifetime of knowledge that the client right. is able to provide. Right. I just never will. Yeah. So it is nice sometimes, even though some of the meetings get long drawn, but if mm -hmm. you get a whole mm -hmm. story of what's happened over the last yeah. number of decades, it really helps you to kind of understand the family and, and get a feel for what yeah. they want and what they want to see out of things. So, yeah. It, when my son was a teenager, sometimes he would have a proposal for me, like, Mom, <laughs> can I do this with this person and this? and and sometimes I would, I would, beyond the information he'd given me, I would say, is there anything that I don't know that if I did know, it might affect <laughs> my answer? And so, same kind of thing, approaching a professional, like, hey, I've asked about this and this and this, but is there anything I haven't brought up that you think might be worthy in, in discussing? So, okay. it's really important to ask good questions, but I am so excited about the event that you're doing. I think, why aren't all my friends coming? Because <laughs> we, we are all going to deal with this, whether it's our, it's our own death or it's a family member's death. We are going to deal with it. And so I think, let's steer it, let's plan it, let's make the best choices we can about this part of life. Let's not react to it and have regrets or let a family blow up because the funeral actually became the catalyst to deal with all the family issues and you know the fight happens in the lawyer's office or at the funeral home or like we can do better than that and so I just really encourage you take the advantage of this opportunity to hear from these three professionals uh, who all come at it from a different perspective different area of expertise and just let them make you aware of what you might not be aware of because your, your legacy is going on after you, and why wouldn't you care for it just as much as you care for your life? For sure. Yeah. I could not sum it up any better way than that. So, Nelly, I just want to thank you very much for taking some time out of your schedule to yeah. hop on the podcast. My pleasure. If listeners want to touch base with you or Garth, what is kind of the best way to do that? Yeah, our website is yourlimitslifted.com and you can reach me at melanie at yourlimitslifted.com or garth at garthep.com. Perfect. I will put all that information in the show notes. Feel free to reach out to Melanie and Garth. They have a wonderful amount of resources and uh, tools available for small businesses and individuals to take advantage of. So for the Tax Talk Podcast, I'm Jared Plon. Thanks again for listening. Take care, and we will talk soon.